Hello. <laughs> I'm not going live for this one because I think it's going to be more of a rambly one. I might even delete it, but something that's interesting about um, this whole thing about um, <clears throat> my one of my core defining traits has been this kind of mendicancy, which I, you know, for 10 years of doing this thing, I haven't really even called it that much. I, I branded it, you know, simple living and wisdom practitioner and uh, inspired by XYZ people. Um, and sometimes even now I think like, is it a reach with the mendicancy title? Is that even apt because I'm not a part of an official order. Um, but I still think it does encapsulate what a lot of my aims are. But what is interesting, so that is kind of more of the origin and like the, the core of like the past habit energies and actions and intentions have more been couched in that mendicancy realm for the most part, even though I've, like I talked about in my 30 minute video talking about the 10 insights from it, I've worn many hats to been, you know, various kinds of teachers and activisty things and, and whatever. But uh, what is interesting, though, is what I think is bubbling up more and what I think is almost like a kind of an, a not necessarily an evolution because I don't want to get too much into a binary way of thinking about this. But moving towards rewilding as a, as a focusing element is really intriguing to me because I've definitely had elements of that over the years. You know, going to Rainbow Gathering is totally like a rewilding thing. You know, when you're going there, you're living off grid. You're plugging in the natural rhythms of nature. You're around other, a bunch of people that are kind of trying to figure out what the heck that even means and to kind of undomesticate themselves. And, and Suelo was really big on that. In fact, he was probably more of a rewilder in many respects than any kind of a mendicant because he was so outside the box and was more sort of in tune with the natural rhythms and living in the caves of Moab and, and being more in that kind of space than some kind of um, like overtly religious or spiritual thing, even though that was also mixed in there. Um, but yeah, but I want, my question is for myself for the next you know, 10 and 20 years of this experience and beyond really. I mean, <laughs> I'm pretty much committed, but uh, there's a few things because with the, with the mendicancy ideology, it kind of, it kind of like I noticed, I started thinking more of like, like last, this last spring when I made that video, I was like, and huh, where was I even in that headspace with that? And I was like, I was reminiscing about Deer Park. I was missing Deer Park and kind of just the security and the kind of roadmap that that provides. Because it really, like, if you plug into these places, it's like easy mode for, versus, you know, you're kind of hodgepodging it together for whatever I've been doing. Because <laughs> um, it's just very streamlined and laid out. And, you know, there can be some cons to that. But on balance, it's like, it's very nourishing and supportive, especially if you're coming from a mainstream to monk mode it's very it makes a lot of sense it's like what are you doing even doing anything mainstream working for a dollar wage slavery it's like just if you can have the blessing of becoming a monastic or something even for five years or something do it like it's it, do that instead of college i mean it's crazy but uh, you know we don't necessarily always have the conditions or causes to kind of cultivate that or have a background. For example, even like me thinking about becoming a Franciscan, just like it was like you know an option off the menu, is a bit far fetched because I don't have that background. 
I didn't even believe in Christ for 25 years. So like <laughs> you can't even, it's like a big bleep, you know, unless you have some amazing experience where like he comes and visits you or something and then you maybe could do that. But that's not my case. And I'm also aged out of a lot of these traditions too, because I'm, I'm 41. So there's like this, there's this sense where it's like, if I was really meant to join an order, there would have been conditions and causes and something that would have propelled me there earlier, you know? And there's still a slim chance, like, you know, Deer Park is, the age cut off is 50, but I just don't know. And so it's kind of a tough one for me because it's sort of like, if you have that awareness in your back of your head where you're like, well, I can always join an order in some regard. It's sort of, it kind of messes with your your forecasting and your vision a little bit because those things are in conflict, you know? And it's even a funny thing too because, I mean, I've talked with those Sosuela and other people that live like me that are like free agents. It's like, you know, we're like more of friends. We're friends of these in institutions on a parallel path but just outside of it, we're lay friends. That seems to me more fitting, and that's fine. But the thing is, is you're not really reaping the benefits of the protective, nourishing container of these physical locations where it's like you can physically go and plug in. Now, you know, some places it's a little easier than others. Like even with Deer Park, I, I could probably finagle, you know, something with them where, I do more of a work trade or something because I can't afford, I can't afford their, their prices. Their prices, even, even they have scholarships are really high. And I've even thought about going to, you know, buy a Geary or something, which is pure donation. And there's always, it's like, much like Suelo says, well, I think on his, his Facebook profile, he's got something where it's like, you know, I'm, I'm where the money is not or whatever <laughs> location where the money is not. <clears throat> And that's always kind of what I've felt like too. It's like I'm sort of guided by where I will I not be predatorily wrung out of my precious little monies that I do have um, just for existing and trying to contribute and be of benefit, you know? Where will I be welcomed? And where will I be, you know, honored for what I'm trying to do that I've been doing for years? And it's very clear sometimes where that will be, you know, much like in Portland, it was like, you know, I get, I got mass evicted from a house, which I was welcomed and honored in. And then I found one that was even better. And that was like, great, perfect. And that's why it's been a little weird here with my dad, because he doesn't quite get what I'm doing, but I'm still his son. So it's like, that's the, that's the first thing. And then the, he wreck he, every month I think that goes on, he recognizes my mendicancy and, and respects it to some degree, but he, you know, we're on different levels. So, so it's been a little weird where I've been in this little bubble of this little eddy of like, I'm the sun and no matter what I do, I'll be hosted. So it's kind of cool from an unconditional love angle, but I also feel like it's like, am I even really doing my mendicancy? <laughs> like if, if whoever's hosting me doesn't even really know what's going on with it it's, it's, a, it's a funny one it's like it's like being unemployed from being unemployed it's a weird feeling but um but yeah this the rewilding thing is, is very intriguing and i think what what broke through with it with it for me is uh, leaving veganism behind which you know has been a year and realizing how there's a lot of beautiful things about it but and it's very well intentioned, but it sort of is largely a product of urban people that are disconnected from things. And they're trying to, of course, combat the horrors of using animals for all their products and factory farms. So it's like everyone who knows about that is in agreement, but we are in a tough situation. And then there, of course, there are concerns about you know, health issues and things and getting all your bases covered. And, and maybe, you know, if you're 80% plant-based, that's might be the most optimal thing for all parties considered, you know, 
And if you source your stuff locally, you hunt or you fish, then like, I, even as a vegan of eight years, I always thought the people that hunted and fish in a sustainable manner was like pretty much fine for me. It's like, yeah, I mean, that's a natural thing to do. Um, <clears throat> but I just know leaving that ideological, ideological camp behind and group think has been helpful because it really sort of was a catalyst to the re rewilding element because there was always a block. There was always this block. And, and that's one reason why in the, I didn't plug in as deeply with permaculture communities in Portland because of all the animal usage. Cause it was like this weird, you know, red light where it was like, Oh, well, they've used animals or they promote animal use and like they're bad. <laughs> and I kept, I was always hung up on that. Right. Cause if you're trying to be ideologically and intellectually congruent and right it, it makes sense with what you're doing your actions align with what you're thinking and vice versa then you're not going to plug in that much and, and unfortunately like that ha that didn't do me any favors i don't think you know it kind of hurt me in some ways kind of getting getting swept up in the the vegan ideology because i think i would have been way more open to traveling and plugging into different communities and different people and experiences, you know, but, you know, here we are. Um, because, um, and yeah, so that's why it's interesting because like the mendicancy classically as it is, it's sort of almost like a thing that deals or that interfaces more with people and the governments and the systems and the rewilding is like this real wild card, no pun intended, like, Cause that can of course take many different expressions too. You can have people that are, you know, survivalists, bushcrafter, permaculture types. Um, right. As you classically think about it. And then there's a lot of indigenous wisdom and, and, and ancestral skills and things woven into that. That's part of like the meat and potatoes of rewilding. And I think, you know, I, I made I made a statement a while ago where I was like, I'm going to try and merge the mendicancy and the rewilding. And then months later, I'm like, well, I don't know if they're actually, they might be incompatible in some ways, actually. And so it's not like I want to go one or the other because I'm informed by both. But it, and sort of have, it's sort of like a, in, certain, it, in certain conditions or certain places, I can sort of wear either hat and take them off even on a day-to-day -day basis. Like, and, and even certain interactions with certain people, those kinds of elements will come up more or those uh, ways of relating will come up more, right? But um, but it is a, it's a funny one, though, because if it's like if you're going to lead with one or the other, as, you know, our binary brains kind of want to do, because um, both are like... They're both really huge philosophical paths and, and aims and orientations. And they will definitely take you in different directions if you go deeper in one or the other. You know, like, for example, like I said, with the, with the mendicancy, when that arose again, or at least the realization that that's really at my core, a big part of my core, then it had me thinking, yeah, well, maybe I should go to a Bayagiri or check out some monastery again right because it's sort of like because because uh, you know as a free agent mendicant it's almost like it doesn't exist because it's such a weird thing and it's not honored and supported so one naturally wanting to be secure and safe to some degree goes well geez i should just go to a, a some kind of spiritual community either and and either plug in and join which like i said it's probably not in my cards or be a lay friend supporter and, and be able to stay there for extended periods of time where you're basically reaping most of the benefit anyway. So yeah, it's interesting. I think too, what's bubbling up more for the rewilding element is, uh, I'll probably be going to the garden finally, um, in the new year, probably in the spring. Like for real. 
because <laughs> I've talked about it for a while and have had many recommendations from people and and especially because of the show and discovery it came out and kind of cast more light on people that are there and it reminded me of all like the the good rainbow family vibe stuff and you know because there's an element from part of the isolation of the pandemic is you kind of lose track of who you are because we're shared and we're collectively held together our identities right and who we think we are and um and what's funny too even as i you know it's like this whole video i'm recording now is such like a what do i think about myself in this little island bubble <laughs> but in reality right that's not even the case because it's like I, I wouldn't even be making this if i was probably in a community or had been for a while so it's just my thoughts about my identity sort of ruminating <laughs> out of out of idleness more than anything as opposed to you know you just wake up every day and there you are and you're you're you are melding together with others and you're this kaleidoscope of 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 expression um but 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 definitely i think with the garden though and the rainbow family in general and intentional communities in general that are not like uh spiritually focused or monastic orders places like twin oaks and alpha farm and all that kind of thing um is that there is an element where you know at at their core they are trying to get back to a rewilding ethos where it's like we're humans we used to live like this for thousands of years before dominant culture took over and said this is the way we're doing it and it's like everyone's sort of held hostage and we're and all these people are like, I don't want to be a hostage anymore. I want to live a thriving, beautiful life that lives closer to nature, closer to how we used to live indigenously. And for the most part, these intentional communities are the best thing we got. They're little lifeboats. So it's just a curious thing because Uh, even that, you know, that they have their host of issues. But when when you're all when we are all collectively the lost children of of Babylon, like what do you expect? You know, you have to you have to be reasonable, and we can't we can't all run off into the woods and join true indigenous tribes because there are barely any left. And even then, it wouldn't work because it's the kind of thing that you have to grow up with to really to really fit with. Um, which I'm always reminded of, you know, stories of when the, the colonists first came to this country. You would actually have quite a few white settlers that would leave their baloney <laughs> on all their hard scrabble stuff of the Western culture and join the natives, basically, you know, going native, as it were. Because there's a lot, I mean, there's so many more benefits and there was more, much more egalitarian harmony, and you know, it was just a better deal in many respects. But I just always thought that was so telling. It's like even like dances, dances with wolves, which is a you know Hollywood movie, but that happened there, right? Where he's like, he was sent out there to run this outpost, which had been left derelict, and then. He forms this relationships with uh, the Native Americans, and and uh, he's like, "Wait a minute! Like you all are cool, and 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 my I'm like a not military, and that that kind of sucks. Like <laughs> this is kind of a raw deal. I got I got sucked into, you know, and and he was a veteran of the Civil War too. This is right after the Civil War, and he got you know beat up and shoot up during that whole disaster." But um, it's just kind of funny because, you know, it, it, does, it does happen, you know. And, it, and even the uh, other, other the, the Japanese Dances of Walls, which is uh, uh, the Tom Cruise movie, The Last Samurai, which basically it's like the same storyline, is also is a thing because the samurai culture 
uh, much like the Native Americans, was one that had a lot more community. It had a, a grounding ethos that was wholesome oriented. And they were like fighting against the modernization in the 1800s where gunpowder came in and the samurai were being made obsolete. I mean, it's a bit more messy, but uh, you just have these two cultures that are fighting against the dominant one. And um, and that's what, you know, that, that rewilding catch-all kind of does in a lot of ways. It's rejection of a lot of mainstream things and a lot of mainstream banality. Um, and I guess part of the, the thing with the mendicancy is a funny one is not, it's not necessarily like it's so challenging of the mainstream. It sort of side saddles up to it and almost relies on it too, which I've often said, you know, like Deer Park and other places, even a Bayagiri are going to be in some trouble in the next 10, 20, 30 years as collapse gets funkier because they are so reliant on the system and lay people for donations and things that when all these processes start getting funkier, it's like, do these people, like, how are they going to get their food very clearly? Cause that's, what's crazy about, you know, it's like, it's not very hard to live in some ways, especially if you're on an Island or something in Hawaii, because you just got to eat, find some shelter and not get killed by predators. I mean, it's like, you know, like the very basic elements aren't too crazy, you know, but we've just, we've made so many bizarre layers of culture and society in the system that it, it's this weird insult to injury with taxes and working and, and, and on and on and on and on. Right. It's like just madness, but like, at the base level, survival is pretty simple and pretty uh, sustainable, even though it has its own hangups and challenges. But like, you know, I often used to think about that too with like, with my lifestyle, even it's sometimes because it's been, I've had many weeks and, and months and days that go by where, because I don't have to run out, run around and hustle and make a bunch of money and stuff that it does seem like that where it's like, I'm just eating, I'm eating, I'm sleeping. Like it's very, <laughs> it's very simple, you know? And I'm, there's some life for it that, that is keep keeping me animated through these processes of just, right. It's pretty basic. And of course there are other needs that, that, that need to be met too. But at the, at the core level, it's not, it's not that complicated. So, yeah, it's just an interesting contrast to see that, you know, I think like the mendicancy and the principles of that have their place for me and how to show up and how to interface with institutions and people and and of course, all the practices that are associated with that for mindfulness and, and all the things. I was actually just watching a Neem Karoli Baba, which is Ram Dash and Krishna Das's guru little thing today. Um, but one thing too, speaking of that even, is like the spiritual realm and how it's been co-opted by capitalism is gross. And so I think almost with like rewilding there's more of a purity there in some ways because you don't have like these Western people that are adrift and have no culture and soul sort of that are showing up to all these ashrams and places seeking meaning and some guidance because they just have, they don't have it. And they're just children, children that are wandering. And, um, and then people get taken advantage of constantly, right? The guru thing and the cult leaders and all this kind of thing. And um, and so there's a lot of problems in that spiritual capitalist uh, realm of things. People charging arm and leg for services and dharma and on and on. <clears throat> um, 
so yeah, I'm just curious if like maybe I've been barking up the wrong tree a little bit with this with this journey I've been on, and maybe I do need to switch switch gears more to leaning. If I'm gonna lean one way or the other, then maybe it's rewilding. Um, and, and like I said, it's like if you're gonna lean one way or the other, mendicancy leads me to more spiritually focused physical places and centers. And the rewilding leads me to more places like the garden, right? Because I also realize that I'm not going to be, I don't have the skills or the inclination to live solo off grid or like scrounge around in the woods like a hermit, which there was famously a, a main hermit that did that for years and was kind of a scoundrel because he had to like break into cabins and things and, and steal food <laughs> because how, how do you do it in this, in this structure? It doesn't work. You know, it's very rare. It's such a gargantuan effort. And then we need people. We need people. We need a community. It's, it's like the ultimate hard mode to be some kind of self-sufficient mountain man. And unless you were raised with these skills and, and tools, it's such like a huge adjustment that it doesn't make sense. You know, and one, you twist your ankle out there and you're all alone in the woods, you're done. But I guess that's sort of what you, what you buy into if you're going to go that route. But it just makes a lot more sense to find a, a community that's, that's open to rewilding principles and plug in there and then you grow together so so yeah um and speaking of that even I, one of my little side projects that i that i have that i've been because i used to go barefoot around um portland forever but um uh before i get ahead of myself i've been thinking about making moccasins and uh, because it's like I'm here in the winter still for a little bit. And my keen Newport sandals, which are often described as the ugliest shoe ever made, are fine. And I've grown used to them. But there's this kind of weird element. Like, they're one, they're pretty heavy a shoe, actually. Pretty heavy, pretty bulky, pretty thick sole, and they're pretty stiff. So a lot of times you're just kind of tromping around and it, even tromping around in the brush, like off trail is a weird feeling in these things. Cause they also scoot around. Cause there's like this, you know, that you're kind of held on this mesh thing, this leather mesh that you can tighten, but still there's a bit of like your, your foot will move around cause it's uh, flexible. So that's kind of a weird feeling too when you're moving up different angles and slopes and, and, um, so you either have to really cinch it tight and also wear a sock maybe to help with that. But it's, it's, it's not like the best off trail shoe. Um, and even traction issues can pop up with that. Um, so it just sort of came to me. I was actually watching an episode of survivor man where he's stuck in a car in uh, Norway and he rips up the upholstery because <laughs> it's amazing right when you only have what you have available all the, the stuff and a car has tons of stuff tons of materials that you can use he even made a sled that he was carrying behind him and uh, he made he made mucklucks for snow and that kind of reminded me of like oh yeah moccasins Cause I, I, you know, I love barefooting and I, that's what I was saying. Like in Portland, I used to barefoot all over the place for six or seven months out of the year. And, um, like all around town even. And I used to like, I'd walk on the pavement and I'd pop into like the grass and the, and the, and the, and the little side bits that were not man-made for like relief and like kind of playing around with the textures and it's so different, like I tell you, like, because it's the thing, it's about shoes. It's almost like shoes are basically forced on us just so that we can be shielded from all the man-made baloney, right? And all and all the things about, of course, you know, no shoes, no service, too. 
um, and and walk around in stores. You you just I used to actually when I was barefooting all the time, I would carry my sandals in my backpack and bust those out when I had to go into the co-op or whatever. But it's just a funny thing because like I even was when I helped move my my uncle my uncle's stuff in here uh, in September. I was doing it barefoot, going up and down the deck. And I, I was like, this is great. Like, this is what I prefer to do. Um, and even when I was actually helping to caregive for him for in those first few weeks, I was wearing my shoes more. But then I was like, why? Like, I'm inside. Like, I don't need them. Like, I have better control with my feet. I have better grip feeling because my toes are involved. They're not just, like, encased in this thing, you know? That's the thing. You lose your toes, basically. Your toes get get <laughs> right they're just they're like okay you're just chilling in the, in the top of the foot now and then there's just this block your foot's just a block and it's just clomping around and so it's a funny thing and then then the and the feet are amazing because they're this like bioorganic repairable dynamic thing and of course you know there's the whole earthing thing too where a lot of studies show that that's very beneficial to be in contact with the ground through the electromagnetic field and just all these other things and sensations. And like, I'll tell you what, like a lot of people know, but like think about walking on sand on the beach where you think about if you even hit like, uh, which I would always enjoy when you'd be walking on the pavement and you hit a little stretch of like moss and it was amazing. It's like, Whoa, what is this thing? What is this fun little thing? Cause could you imagine, like I said, it's, it's basically these man-made, super hard super dense super rough and grainy surfaces that force most people into, into protecting their feet you know because otherwise they get ripped apart but like if you can imagine if if our if all the sidewalks were like covered in a fine layer of moss right <laughs> like that would be just amazing i mean i would i would walk across america on that if there was like a moss trail Right, like this natural trail, whatever thing uh, that you can just walk on. And that's of course why a lot of people do the PCT, and some people do that barefoot, even though it's pretty rare because it's kind of be pretty rough on you. Um, but some people will do it all in like Keens or sandals, which gets you closer to that. But at any rate, one of my little projects um, is yeah, is I'm gonna cobble together some moccasins this week maybe even later today just using some random materials because at its core element a moccasin is basically just hide deer hide whatever historically speaking that's just a one material it's one sheet right it's one solid piece and then you just pull it up and you wrap it around 